I guess we should begin. We'll call the meeting to order. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the United States. All right. Um, We'll do the roll call, please. President Cook? Here. Vice President Dow? Here. Commissioner Fritz? Present. Secretary Thomas? Here. Trustee Everard? Here. Trustee Gayton? Here. Um, the next item is 4.0 public. So, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak? Sir? Please come up and. Uh, as long as you don't throw anything. I'm <laughs> with you. My name is Matthew Umertowski. Uh, do I have to say my address or do I just say my name? Okay. Um, I once sat in your chair, so I appreciate your time. I'm a trustee emeritus and uh, appreciate the time that's dedicated to do what you do. I know what's involved. So thank you very much. I'm here before you today to speak about one of the agenda items. One of the agenda items that you'll review tonight is regarding the request from a snowmobile club to enter one of the properties where we currently have waterfowl hunting. And so I want to let you know a couple of things about me. Number one, I'm a lifelong resident of the county. Number two, I've obviously dedicated a lot of time to the district as a volunteer, uh, not just as a board member, but other things that the district does through volunteer opportunities. And of course, I'm an avid hunter and fisher and have two young boys. One of them is here today as well. Um, and what we're asking is that you respectfully decline the opportunity from the snowmobile club to use that particular property. And there's two reasons why. Number one, Obviously, there's hunters that use that property, and you may or may not know based on your tenure with the board, the board has already approved the removal of a waterfall property due to a snowmobile trail going through, I believe, Brookdale, if my memory is correct. Number two, there are paid hunters that use the hunting property. As a participant, we pay um, probably some of the higher fees, and understandably so, we use it for a lot of different uh, reasons and timeframes. And to my knowledge, those snowmobile users do not use that. And I'd like you to um, leave that property for the hunting opportunities that exist in the district. Number two is not just about hunting. Um, that particular space provides a lot of things to the waterfall in the area, whether it's food, cover, water that they're in. Um, so it's not just about the hunting, but it's the overall environmental factor of allowing snowmobiles to use that property. And I will tell you that as a board member, I have been a supporter of the snowmobile club and I voted for the snowmobile to go through various other, the snowmobile trails go through other various properties of the district. Um, I will just might add that, um, you know, a lot of those hunters volunteer time. Most of them are local residents, not all of them. Um, I'm not sure if those snowmobilers that are using that trail are residents of our county. I'm not sure if any of the monies that they pay to ride the snowmobile impact the district. So I think it's a multifaceted approach why you should decline the opportunity for the snowmobile club to go through. I might add one more thing. Uh, my young son shot his first duck on district property last weekend. I too, believe it or not, shot my first duck ever on district property. I would just respectfully request that you decline the request from the Snowmobile Club to use uh, Queen Anne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your remarks. Okay. Is there anyone else who, uh, from the public that would like to speak? Okay. Um, we're going to it come to the snowmobile request a little bit later in the program. Okay. So uh, going to 5.0, the presentations, the first one is pack in, pack out proposal. Who's going to speak for that? Hello. Good evening, everybody. Harry uh, Moore, operations manager. For the conservation district, of course. Um, I'll wait for yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. So about a year ago, um, it was brought to the district's attention by its current vendor in uh, service that there would be uh, substantial increases to the recycling service and uh, slight increase to the uh, trash removal service. A uh, reason for that being is that. Um, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little longer, uh, the country of China increased its um, regulations on accepting recyclables from overseas, including in the United States. 
So uh, looking at that, as well as the increase uh, to the services in general, led us to uh, review our current trash and recycling program uh, that we've had in place for many years. Um, in doing so, we came up with a new proposal and it's called Pack In, Pack Out, which is nothing new throughout the country, but it would be uh, you know, a new program that would be hopefully implemented by the Conservation District. Um, next slide, please, Elizabeth. So the plan. The plan is basic, and that is to keep the natural areas beautiful. By doing so, we would implement this uh, program that's already back out. It's a movement that's uh, being implemented by parks across the country in an effort to keep our natural spaces just that, natural. Additionally, these actions help increase sustainability and viability of recyclables, protects the wildlife and environment, help save our maintenance costs, allowing us to use resources to more directly benefit site users and eliminate human-made trash cans to provide more scenic views. Increasing sustainability, recycling is important for our environment. <clears throat> the large percentage of public recycling receptacles face contamination when people dispose of trash in these containers. I just wanna to add to that, that our, our current vendor, um, they said that in order for us to continue the recycling services for the conservation district, <laughs> meant that there had to be very little contamination um, in these dumpsters. So what staff would do is collect the recyclables from our centers, from our shops, and from the parks, and then go into dumpsters at our shops, whether it's recycling or the trash. Uh, for them not to be contaminated meant that they would only be allowed to have one or two garbage bags mixed in with the recycling. If there was more than that, they would take that recycling, charge us that cost, but it would go into the trash. And uh, sadly, that's uh, pretty much a common practice these days because of the cost to recycle. Um, protecting the wildlife environment, trash cans attract many animals, including raccoons, possums, and squirrels. Garbage and food in these cans can pose danger to these animals. Additionally, animals often dump cans, leaving garbage to blow across the district's landscape. Uh, another important uh, item is reallocating resources. Uh, by removing many of these trash cans and recycling uh, receptacles, the district is saving additional staff time and resources, which can be then applied to services more directly uh, to benefit site users. A good example of that would be infrastructure, of course, um, being able to maintain our roads, parking lots, walkways, and our bridges by um, more of this taking place in house as opposed to contracting it out and uh, saving the district money and uh, focusing more on that and uh, then uh, collecting trash and recycling on our sites. And then finally, preserving scenic views. Removing these cans help us preserve, excuse me, preserve the scenic natural views of the Kennedy County. Next slide, please. So, in order to do that, we created a phasing out process. And as you see on this slide, currently there are 175 trash cans throughout the district and 47 recycling containers throughout. Uh, once implemented, we reduced the number of trash cans down to 133, and we would have zero recycling containers except at the district's three visitor centers and uh, nine shops. Um, looking at the spacing out process, we created a priority list on this um, on where to remove these trash cans and recycling containers. Uh, we would start with parking lots, move on to, and with parking lots, we uh, started that a couple years ago in some select areas, just because of the amount of fly dumping we had. You know, uh, these increased costs not only affect the conservation district, but its residents here in the Kennedy County. And uh, we've seen over the past few years, of course, more fly dumping taking place in the parking lots. Uh, so therefore, we've already removed some of those cans from the parking lots. We would move on to trailheads. Uh, most of our trailheads have pest, pet waste um, dispensers um, for the site users, for the hikers and uh, skiers. And most of those then also have a receptacle mounted below, which you'll see in the later slide. We would like to take that uh, example that I'll show you in the slide and, and implement that in our trailheads uh, for pet waste. And then uh, regional trails, we would not do a total removal of trash receptacles, but strategically reduce the number 
And then uh, finally, at shelters, uh, we would like to start like the beta program uh, with some of our smaller shelters to see how that would be implemented and received by our site users. Uh, it could be a challenge, of course, at the shelters um, because there is a lot of trash generated during those events. And then uh, we will move on to camping. And as you see on this slide, Thomas Woods in the Hollows to your left. Uh, we have dumpsters in place for our campers and then trash cans at Dice Woods, Rainbow Ridge, and Rush Creek. Those would stay in place, of course, because typically our campers are there for a lengthy stay. It's not just one day, you know, in and out. It's for two or three days and evenings generating a bunch of trash. We don't expect them to keep that in their vehicles. You cannot keep them uh, just in uh, trash bags. The raccoons, of course, would get into them. Uh, they know the locations quite well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. So these, these would be the pet waste stations uh, that we like to have uh, implemented and put in place at our trailheads. We do have them already at some of our trailheads, uh, but basically what you see there would be the signage and then the dispenser, and then that bottom container is receptacle for those pet waste bags. Um, until we are able to phase in the rest of those uh, pet waste stations, as well as that receptacle, we would keep garbage cans in place at the trailheads until they can be fully implemented. Uh, next slide. And then we get into the messaging. And uh, of course, what you see on this slide, uh, we will coordinate with the communications department on the district's messaging. That would include uh, the website, social media, uh, through our permit reservation program, at our shelters, uh, with temporary signage and display cases. And as you see here, temporary signage. We put those at strategic locations, at trailheads, high use areas, and, and larger parking lots um, for the public to see that. And as you see the center one with the display cases, that's where we would start you know, um, implementing the pack in pack out program. And then of course at our website. Uh, next slide please, Elizabeth. And then we did, a, we did a review of other local park agencies to see what they had in place. Um, beginning with Bolo Block, uh, no recycling containers, no trash cans, and we do have uh, similar messaging on site that you saw in the previous slide uh, with those temporary signage at high use areas. Nine Hill State Park, of course, no recycling containers, limited trash cans, no messaging. I think a number of these sites are going to see that there's no messaging um, at these sites because these programs were implemented um, probably some time ago already. Chain Lake State Park, no recycling. Um, Containers, excuse me, bless you. Thank you. Um, trash can or a small dumpster located in each one of the parking lot. Um, a number of our, our staff went out and did a you know personal tour of these sites just to take a look at firsthand to see what was or wasn't in place. Uh, DuPage County Forest Reserve, no recycling uh, containers, no trash cans. So again, small dumpsters, uh, messaging was absent. And then finally, Will County Forest Preserve, recycling containers. But we did receive uh, information from the staff, excuse me, recycling containers in place, but they were throwing that away with the trash because they were getting contaminated, uh, similar to what we've been experiencing here at the Conservation District, and some trash cans in place. Um, so that's the new pack in, pack out program that uh, we would like to implement. Uh, we'd like to do so sometime beginning this fall, winter, uh, to roll that program out. Uh, that's the best time for our staff to do so and uh, probably be a little easier on our site visitors as well as we trans transition students into this new program. So that is it. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. When we when the team visited these six or so sites, was there litter? What was the observation other than litter not cans were there? Was it clean or? It, it was relatively clean, I think, because again, uh, those you know four or five uh, park agencies that had the program in place already for quite some time did not see the messaging. I think you know site users became acclimated to that, expected you know that they were to carry whatever they brought in, they brought out. So there was very little, and the timing of it too as well. Like for the conservation district, we conduct rounds every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Right. So it's either before the weekend, after the weekend, and then in the middle of the week. So it depends upon the timing, of course, when we went out there, if their staff, you know, had recently been out there to, you know, 
um, conduct rounds at the sites. But personally, uh, as well as what I report, reports from other staff, there's very little trash. In the night. What kind of cost savings are we looking at? So cost savings, we, we, we crunched the numbers. Um, so what we have in place with the operations department, it's called a maintenance impact statement, which that has been created for each site. And what that does is basically tells us what the cost is of labor to maintain our sites. And, and one of those line items is trash and recycling services. So we did uh, some estimates. The indirect costs, which would be the labor to uh, maintain the cans, pull the trash, take it to the shops, uh, purchase cans, repaint them. Uh, we're looking at about $76,000 for the entire program, uh, the cost of the district. If we were to implement that, there'd be approximate cost savings of about $20,000. That's where we could take that indirect cost savings and that labor and redirect it to um, you know, more um, maintenance of our infrastructure and uh, provide a better experience uh, for our site users. Yes, ma'am. I don't follow you. So you said it's $76,000 one time or every year? Every year. That's annual. You go through that many cans? Well, it's cans, but it's more of the labor. Oh. It's, it's, it's our ranger staff and our seasonal staff going out to each site, whether it's campground, shelter, picnic area, regional trails, it's, it's, that, it's that windshield time and then the time to go pull the trash, put in new liners, bring it back to our shops, dump it in recycling, you know, or, or go to the trash, you know, on depending on what it is. And then for the dog waste, and you're gonna have to buy- The receptacles? Yeah. Yes. You can't just use a garbage can? We can, we can, that's what we're doing right now. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're not looking to, Go to go to purchase uh, the first year, you know, 30, 40 of these receptacles. Because you're going to have all these garbage cans. And what are you going to do with them? With the garbage cans? I mean, if you don't, if you get rid of the recycling. Yeah. Well, then the, the fortunate thing is most of the garbage cans are 55 gallon drums that have been repurchased or repurposed. Paint cans, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, that the highway department would use to strike. We would receive those either as a, oh. as a donation or we could so purchase them at a discount. Yeah, so it's not a big loss. And then those cans that you see at the shelters, like you saw on the first slide, those were specifically you know uh, designed or picked out by our planning department for our newer shelters. We keep those at the shelters um, because again, there too, as I mentioned earlier, there's much more trash generated at, at, at a shelter when there's 100 people there. It'd be tough to pack it and pack it out, just like it would be for a lengthy uh, stay for, for those campers as well. A little different than a picnic area or trailhead where somebody's bringing a sandwich to the shelter or, or, or hiking the trail with a water bottle and they can take it back with them home. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a much better chance of this recycling actually being recycled at home residential versus you know at our at our parks uh, because of the contaminations, you know, issue that uh, we're dealing with. The other thing I was going to say with this, uh, with any new program, you try it, you see, you tweak. And so I think, too, one of the questions that I had asked if we move forward with our trash receptacles, if we're not repurposing them, to place them, see how things work so that should we have to roll back out and go backwards, we're able to do so without having to have another big investment, right? So, again, we're looking for success. We feel there's very conservation minded individuals, a lot is within education and messaging. Clearly, different counties have had different experiences, different places. I do appreciate the work that our uh, I mean, parks and team have done on this, looking for efficiencies. Um, and uh, again, we won't know until we really give it a try to see if it will be successful. But clearly, there is a the con contamination of recycling and really what's happening and a safety factor for our staff. I and mean, we can't go through the trash cans and sort them to determine and divide out, you know, recyclable and. and those have kids at home, you know what's challenging they have at home to, to divide what goes in the recycling bin goes in the trash can. So, um, yeah, so I think, yeah. So and that's did you say it would be the inner sites? You would just you know, try it in a couple of places first? We, we, we would like with the shelters because, you know, um, it, it's hard to say, project on how that will be received by the public and how that will, you know, function. Um, it's easy to say you're going to pull in that parking lot. We've done it before, and the results are positive. 
uh, we can easily, you know, tap in and say that with picnic areas because those, you know, site users are going in for a few hours, let's say to grill or, or to have their lunch. And it's a small amount of trash versus trash being generated at a shelter or at a campground. That's why um, <laughs> in my notes, we would start with the data program. We would say to start with a small shelter versus a large shelter and, and to see how that's received. And, you know, if, if it's successful or not, we don't know that. And as Elizabeth, you know, just, just mentioned, the great thing about it is it doesn't work <laughs> really bad, you know, mm -hmm. to some of those areas that we thought maybe it would work. Hey, Perry, who's our current vendor? Perry Land Disposal. And we have a contract with them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm all for it, 100%. I don't understand that if we're trying to pack out why we're going to add the pet waste container. I think that it should be all under the same pretense that you take it with you. So the, we looked at that and a couple factors that were weighed into that to say, you know, we should have a receptacle there, whether it's like Pat mentioned, a trash can or if we, you know, actually buy a receptacle that's mounted on that post. Um, myself as a ranger for a number of years, what we've experienced, if you don't place something there, especially pet waste, people have a harder time taking their pet waste with them and putting it in a car versus like a soda can or a bottle. They'll drop it at the trailhead or they'll, they'll, they'll throw it, you know, off into the trail somewhere as they pick it up. They're more apt to do that. I'm not saying 100%, but, you know, it, it's an eyesore, you know, it's a hazard. They have pet waste laying around. And we've experienced that by placing that station at the trailhead that they do get quite a bit of use. Uh, so that's why you think those are going to get filled with garbage? Those are pretty, pretty, look like pretty good sized things. They get filled with garbage. Is that a concern at all? Or? They, the ones we have in place have been so far. And so most of those, if you go to most of our sites, you go to the main parking lot or any parking lot, there's a trailhead, right? So again, we, we pulled a number of those cans from the uh, parking lots because of fly dumping. And then we're thinking, okay, we'll see what happens at the trailhead. At least with the trash uh, or with the pet receptacles, um, waste receptacles, we have not experienced that. We would certainly have to monitor it though, because that may be the case. And that's where we could modify that program and then bring a trash can back if we do. Yeah, we we do similar, right? It's like a beta program. We, we give it a try and see how that see how that works, or if it doesn't, modify it. For sure. Mm -hmm. They have those that receptacles in several places in the park district. And the one thing is the opening is pretty narrow. I mean, yeah, you could put trash in there, but I mean that, that you know that'll help limit it. At least it's a kind of a little bit mailbox mm -hmm. correct. shape on top. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So try to regulate some of it for great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. Right. You're welcome. Any other questions? What do you want from us this evening? This was just an informational piece. Okay. I mean, so we're going to work to distribute that unless we heard anything, the reaction that the, what are you guys doing? But if you're supportive of us moving forward, we will give it a try. And I appreciate it again. We're then bringing it forward just in, in thinking a little bit outside the box to solve them. Let's see what happens. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, under 6.0, uh, one of the items uh, that I, I'd like the board of trustees to uh, look at if they're leisure uh, at home are the uh, tentative dates for uh, meeting in 2023. Time flies and we're, we're you know, approaching the last quarter of the year. So Elizabeth has uh, indicated the dates for the Committee of the Whole and, and then our regular meetings. And um, I think the majority of them probably are quite satisfactory. But if you look at that and you see any potential major problem, then uh, please let Elizabeth know. Um, otherwise, at some point, perhaps next month, this will be an agenda item and we'll approve this. So just to highlight two things on there that are that are the same but, but different. We normally meet the Cal Thursday, then the following Tuesday. That is the pattern that goes throughout the year. The January meetings are moved up so that we have time to have the 30-day review from our tentative budget to the adoption of the final budget. 
and to give that in front of the county and time to meet their March schedule and have it done before April 1st, it starts our fiscal year. The other change is you go into December, I did move it up a week to avoid the holidays. It was following um, the Thursday and then you had the Christmas holiday and then the 26th. So I moved it up a week. If there's any other holidays or concerns that, again, like the flood, let us know and then we can make those adjustments. So uh, then 6.1 is a review of the regular meeting agenda for uh, next week. And uh, it's quite a lengthy consent agenda. Uh, It'll be shorter for your week. Right. Um, so beyond that, I thought it would you know, just be a good reminder for us to have a copy of this and you know, to look it over. And if there's something that uh, you're not happy uh, with on the consent agenda, we can certainly pull it. And if there's anything else that you think requires further discussion before it appears uh, on the agenda, please let uh, Elizabeth or me know. All right. Um, so, um, we had our first round of public comments, and I, but I think a couple of folks then came in who might want to speak in, in that um, context. Am I correct? I think we're just here more for the discussion on the summer, proposed snowmobile trail. Okay. All right. There's not going to be a lengthy discussion with the public at, at this meeting you're certainly welcome to listen to yeah. the board's discussion yeah. okay. right. and good. to ha answer any questions if you guys have any questions on how we have thank you okay. so um i'm going to preface this by saying that uh, the, the trustees uh, receive uh, snowmobile uh, plan, uh, which was addressed to the question of snowmobiling at Queen Anne. And the staff had looked at that and recommended to the board that there not be a snowmobile trail at Queen Anne, um, particularly because there was a, a, an eagle's nest and the proposed trail uh, was within a distance from the Eagle's Nest that violated certain federal rules. The Stonewall community made a presentation to the board. Um, and I think the board um, appreciated their remarks and turned to the staff and asked the staff is there, if there wasn't an alternate route that might uh, meet the snowmobile uh, club's needs and at the same time be environmentally uh, sound. Uh, like anything, the devil is in the details. And as the staff looked at that issue, one of the potential conflicts with alternate routes related to our own hunting program. The dates and places of which and fees for which for the coming season have already been um, outlined, published, and collected. So now the board faces two constituent groups, snowmobilers and hunters. And, and, um, and we, we have a staff that wants to do what is environmentally sound, um, but recognizes that we have a responsibility to all the stakeholders in the country town. Okay. Uh, so those are my remarks. And now I'm going to 
let Elizabeth and her staff present to us where we are at this point in time. I'll take it away. Bill, you did, you did a great job here. And of course, we're always through our formal processes. And sometimes there's a reason why we go through a general when we look to put new trails or sites on property through a master plan process, because that allows for all stakeholders to be aware, constituent groups, and determine different voices being heard in the room. So where we're at, understanding we've got we've got multiple, we've heard from our hunter uh, representation this evening, we've heard from our snowmobile club, we're working through um, you know what we can to preserve and protect. Um, I think I think things can be achieved, but we need time to to work it out from a staff perspective, specifically on the landscape to find the best route. And when we do make improvements, whether it be a bridge over a creek in our R2 based on the alternative that was presented um, and worked out through the last meeting, did identify, which was identified by our planning team earlier on, we did have the one bridge crossing that the district has already that was uh, determined to be not acceptable to allow snowmobiles to go through. This would be the installation on the new route that's being proposed to put two additional bridges in the current proposal. And that requires permitting and looking into that to, to work that out. So something to which, because of the hunting uh, directive that was already approved back in April for the year, the waterfowl on the site, um, needing the time and the realities of being able to get that done, we're proposing as a staff that we don't move forward this year, we plan towards next year and we work with putting the best minds together and also working through the necessary permitting for whatever cost it would be. We would have to determine how that would impact the hunting program. Um, in essence, meeting with both groups, you know, does that require scaling back of the waterfowl hunting in the zones that are taking place there at the Queen currently? Is there another alternative for them someplace else or not? Um, do we work out the dates? But trying to work towards that resolution. So, you know, Brad has prepared a presentation. I don't know if it's a kind of highlighted kind of where we're at. Take it all my thunder, so yeah. 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 So, I can go real quick. I just have some slides I can go really quick if you'd like. Yes, I think so. I think it would be helpful. Sure. Appreciate it. So, yeah, I just want to talk briefly about the hunting program. So a lot of us think about marsh hunting on the water, and that's typically a lot of um, a lot of how uh, duck hunting goes. Give you the next slide. But our, our hunting program includes marsh and what we call field hunting. So our hunters in these situations would be in layout lines, be in the field and waiting for ducks and geese to come in and forage or feed in, the, in those fields. So we have you know two types of hunting. And that's what you'll see. Here's the next slide. So I shouldn't shouldn't have put a big red X. I should have put a big you know smiley face because that's a great thing to have a bald eagle nest on one of our sites. It's just it's it's rare. Uh, so it's a fantastic thing to have there. We should be celebrating that. Um, the blue line is an approximation of where uh, the snow, the this other proposed snowmobile trail, the one we're talking about, could go. So again, from Queen Anne Road on the east, and it would either go through the field or through the field border. I have another um, map showing that, and it's it's actually on the field border. But what I'll get to is the two crossings that we're gonna we're gonna talk about. So yeah, this this route is what we would call the westerly route, and it would avoid the bald eagle nest. That's extremely important. We need next time. So yeah, coming from the south, going north. Um, the, so actually, this is location one. So we'll start at the very north. This is on the um, Zabilski property. So this is not our property. But what would have to happen is the snowmobile would would cross um, either this crossing or crossing number two, picture two. Um, I was out there a, a month ago. Took this picture. I was out there yesterday and, and looked at the creek. It's about a little over a foot deep. So you know, when I was looking at it, I thought, oh yeah, winter frozen. Um, you can just cross it. But that's my knowledge of, of snowmobiling. I don't think that's the best case. We're talking about having a bridge and there's permit involved, there's safety involved if you cross flowing water. So again, that's my limited knowledge. We haven't gone through the master plan, which we all acknowledge. So I was just looking at, um, this, is a, this is a board from the farmers. This is what they use to cross the creek with heavy equipment. So this is not a, a trail, it's not a snowmobile trail, it's a farm crossing of the creek. So that's just plain and simple what it is. Uh, the next one then. So this is on our property. So this is picture two. Um, and it's the same type of thing. It's a it's a Ford crossing. So you drive through it, you can drive through it on ETV, a combine, a truck. And again, it's about a foot deep um, in the middle. And if we go to three, this is the biggest one, but this is Slough Creek. So um, this is the creek that actually comes from Woodstock. 
comes through here. It's wider, but again, the banks are graded back and it's a little over a foot deep in the middle. And in the most part, this would, um, this it does flow all year round and whether it freezes or not um, completely in the winter, I don't know. I don't know about that. But so that, that those are the critical crossing points um, to, to that now we're talking about. So I was really focused on the, uh, the hunting program and I'll get to that. But these are other obstacles that are out there when we kind of delve into the details as somebody mentioned. And two of the three are on district. Property. Two of the three are district property. So you can just kind of go north or you can go northwest once you cross the, the, the south cross in that picture three. Yeah. So this is a, a map of our um, our hunting zone. So what we have here, the, the little blue symbol is actually a marsh zone. So we have one marsh zone out there, and we actually have four field zones. And what we've done with our waterfall program, we have complexes. So we have the, the Queen Anne Prairie complex, we have the Brookdale complex, which is here. Uh, we have the Kishwaukee complex. So if a hunter arrives and there's already another hunter in zone three, well, all he has to do is go down the road and he can take zone two or he or she can take zone one. So we've made these destination locations. So that's why there's four different zones. So um, a hunting group or an individual could take a particular zone and, and go about that way. So it's first come, first serve. So if you're coming on and it's in the dark, it's, again, somebody's in a zone, then you can, you can choose another zone. But we didn't want to have to show up and then all of a sudden you have to drive across the county to another area. So these are a hunting complex is what this essentially is. And again, here is this, this would be, you know, a slightly different trail configuration using the field border. Um, you know, and this one does happen. If you're going to have to go right by the marsh zone, you're going to be kind of going um, by two different uh, field zones. Um, however you did, however you did that trail, um, it would impact with the, with the movement, the noise. Um, snowmobiles would, we would think, would disrupt the, uh, the waterfall for sure. And that's actually what, what Matt was talking about, not only the hunters, but also the waterfall using those fields. It could be a disruption to those, to the birds using those fields. So again, here's a picture. And what's really interesting about geese and even sandhill cranes through banding and radio tracking. So if we get the snow, uh, it's amazing to me that these these birds, these these waterfowl will stick around throughout the winter. But if we get really cold, you know, heavy snow, they will go south. And sometimes, you know, some migratory geese will go all the way south to Louisiana. Some just go as far south as where there's opening, and then they'll actually move back and forth throughout the winter. So they've done that, you know, banding, and they've shown that that geese will come and go, come and go. Uh, but we have so many ponds, so many ten detention areas with aerators that a lot of these geese do stay. Year round, um, the waterfall season does close January either 19th or 20th, so it does it does close for sure. And so then all our waterfall hunting is done at that point in the in the field. So there is an end date for the waterfall season. Um, just so we're aware of that. Um, I did want to mention so, and, and I'm not sure if any of the board members were here at the time, but um, Gabe Powers, who runs our hunting program, actually gave a nice presentation to the board about the um, waterfall program and. And just that we heard from Matt, and you know, when you harvest your first stock, it's something that's you know you remember always. But even any trip you go out hunting, you want to be out there. You want to have that sunrise, that quiet, that peacefulness, and it's a great moment to be out in nature. So you know, hunting is 99% sitting, watching, or calling, and a small amount of shooting and harvesting animals. So part of that experience is being out there when it's quiet, when you're observing wildlife. Um, you're not always going to get a shot, but it can still be a great experience. So I just wanted to bring that up. That was a big part of, of Gabe's presentation a couple of years ago to this board. Um, and just to kind of give you the numbers, so we, you know, we don't have that many opportunities. We have, you know, a few, but um, Queen Anne does represent 60% of the mark zones and 25% of the field opportunities. And I actually think you're going to hear later about Coon Creek, which is another one of our complexes, which some of that will probably be going offline to waterfall hunting. Uh, because of other reasons, because we have to restore it, it's not going to be in agricultural production. So, I mean, it is it is significant to our to our uh, waterfall hunters. So there are options, and and you know Elizabeth kind of highlighted that you know it, it's with with permitting, with trying to figure out this compromise. You know, one option for you tonight is to say, okay, let's just wait, wait a year. That's easy to do. Um, when we get into how do these two you know how to, and they don't have to be at, at odds. You know, but how can we, how can we uh, compromise and find um, a way to get this through? There is an option where you could have the hunting program start and stop and run the whole hunting program, 
In this case, it's January 19th. Next year, be either January 19th or 20th. And then you could start up the snowmobile season. And again, nobody can predict the weather, you know, whether we have a lot of snow in December, it's more likely to have a lot of snow in January and February. So if you did that, there would be no conflict. Have hunting, you know, from October 22nd to January 19th, and then snowmobile season starts, and there'd be no conflict between the two, which is which is great. I'll go to the next slide. Um, the other, the other one. So if you have to pick and choose, and again, this is the decision you know that the board would have to make. You could have you know hunting season start in October and end January. I'm sorry, December 31st, and then be done with the hunters, and then the snowmobile season would start. If there was snow on the ground, that's great. If there's not, then nobody would be using that site. If, if you said the hunters are done December 31st, there would be an 18 or 19 day period where there would be nobody if there was no snow on the ground. So that's the problem with that. And then as it, as it stands this year, we would, I would think we would want to refund money because we've already had our hunters pay for that experience. Same thing if you were, um, you said, okay, our snowmobile season, I talked with um, Ben O'Day, Officially, our trails are could be open December 10th. So it's December 10th to March 10th. So if we said, hey, we really want to go with the snowmobile, we would stop the hunting season December 9th, and then the, the um the, the snowmobilers would start then. Again, the same problem. If we didn't have snow, then in theory there would be nobody using the site. So that's what I have. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah. I got a question again. Sure. So with all the social media, if there's no snow, couldn't you like put on there, hey, hunting's open, you know? Yeah. You, so, I mean, people would still be using it then. It's not like. Yeah. So, I mean, but, but there, there, is a, there is a scenario where if there's, you know, six inches of snow, but then the, the top of a field is blown off and the hunter wants to, to hunt there because there's still access, you know, there's still uh, waterfall in that, then you would have a potential conflict. Um, of hunters using that field and snow are using where there's deeper snow and, and, and doing that. And that does happen. I have seen that where, you know, you get a windswept snow and it's, it might be deep enough to snow bale, but it's only two or three inches on the top of a field where it's going off. So that's, these are the kind of things we have to think about, think about in advance and make sure we don't have any issues. Well, uh, any other questions or comments from the board? Um, it seems to me that the issue of the crossings means that for this season, there isn't going to be a viable snowmobile trail on district property. Yeah, the crossings have not even, that, that was just one of those things that when we just recently talked about right. that, that hasn't been addressed. All right, so, and this is the end of October and you're probably not gonna get those addressed by you know in six weeks or eight well, weeks. Well, they could possibly use them if they can use what's currently there. Those type of open crossing town is it snow building? Can you get through? We've been an open creek crossing in Rush Creek for forty years. And is that on our property? Yes, on the conservation property up by Hart. Is that similar in depth and? So forth to this. I would have to defer. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. Uh, it did it vary. It's varied, but I mean, it kind of was more of a high bank side. But yeah, they've gone. It's ridden through there, you know, as long as I can remember. I would want staff to take a look at that. I guess and take a look at the, the maps and experience of source that Elizabeth would like to please I was a ranger at Rush Creek for many years, maintaining the Rush Creek course that we were into. And as the gentleman mentioned, there's two crossings that uh, on that horse trail section that uh, is utilized by the Snowmobile Club. During the winter time, <clears throat> the one nearest Mini Hill Road is quite shallow, and we actually pulled that bridge a number of years ago uh, to make it safer for the horse riders. Uh, the other crossing that uh, they're referring to uh, does have steeper embankments to it. But again, it, it's it's pretty shallow throughout the year. Um, it has a stone base to it, not large rocks um, that they do travel through and cross through. Um, again, I have not looked at the three crossings that are being proposed. Uh, he can compare that to what's at Rush Creek of Jones for uh, what's there and what will cross. Can I add something? Sure. Um, Watson, three head there on Kaczynski's property. 
We're never going to be doing this. We're going to be all on the east side, west side. We'll go low on the bridge. That's why we're talking about the people here. Okay. 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 So from this map, I guess just from orientation, I don't know if there's a way to. This one here. What's best the one to look at? This would be over here. Yeah. You run all the ball on the side. Right. Right. Hey, right. 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 go back on what you mean. Right there. So yeah, you, you, the, the picture one is the bill skis. That, is it right on the eastern edge? Yeah, right on the eastern edge. Yeah, you guys. We only want to be there. We just <laughs> want to get to here. Okay. We can get in our Zabilski pod any place. We're going to stay all the way on the west side. I talked to Jim, he's a great guy. He has no problem. He's put a bridge across this. We'll take care of that. Well, that's his problem. Yeah. Where would the pathway go then? I guess yeah. I'd want to look at um, that was the case. Well, whatever we can do. This is a bill that's here. Any way to get down to here, we got, we'll have one crossing of water on your guys' books. Any place in here where you can get us across. We'll, we'll go all the way down the edge. If you, if you well, the only problem is we only have the existing crossings. We don't have bridges right now. Right, well, I know that. So we got, we got, we'll have one water thing. And you can I'm see. It gets away from that. I have yeah. one. I have another uh, question. Uh, is hunting show only uh, dawn? Is it dawn and dusk? Is it yeah, only, only during half daylight? an hour, half an hour before before sunrise to half an hour after sunset? So dawn to dusk, basically. Okay, so there isn't any. I mean, if it was just you can hunt in the morning, I doubt that the snowmobilers are out there at six a.m. Um, I mean, I'm just looking at the yeah, compromises. Yeah. Well, Maybe you're going home at 6 a.m. Yeah, I'm going to say that's the case. All right. Excuse me. All right. Um, well, um, gentlemen, um, the board would like to make as many people happy as we can. I think you've raised additional issues about the route, perhaps suggesting that you don't. Um, need two crossings on the district property is what I yes. heard. Yeah. And we've shown that a scenario where they could cross on Zabilski's, but wherever they want to go on that, but they, they still cross us one time. Right. Sure. And is that is that less of an impact on our hunting zones? Not really, because they're, they're still going to be going going through there. Um, yeah, no matter what. Yeah, because the one and then zone two. Um, you just have to get through there. You have to get through that process. Can I ask a question, Brian. Zone one, you had hunters out there. How many years? Uh, quite a few years. And we've had, well, the hunting program's been around since 2001. So uh, we've had hunting on this site for quite a few years. It's 2001. You guys only know that since 2001? Not, maybe not that particular year, but we've had the hunting program since 2001. I'm, I'm sure we've hunted that for seven to 10 years. That sounds and again, a question, uh, how much distance do you need to be safe with respect to a shotgun? Well, there's, you know, you can't hunt within um, 300 feet of an occupied dwelling for, for waterfowl. So that's, you know, you can use that distance. But again, it's, it's um, yeah, if we're trying to, yeah, you would be compromising those zones. I mean, you could, you could do that too. You can shrink zones. Um, yeah, I guess third. that's what I'm trying to get at is what is there a uh, hundred yards? Is it uh, you know a quarter mile? Uh, I, I maybe that's information or uh, those are criteria that the staff needs to develop as it uh, looks at all the alternatives vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis hunting and snowmobiling. I mean, you've mentioned dates of the calendar year. My idea of daylight doesn't seem to fly. Uh, there's a distance consideration. There's still our route considerations. Um, it's a work in progress, and I don't think we're going to set a deadline to say that you have to resolve this, um, you know, by Halloween or by Thanksgiving. So give it your best effort. Uh, 
whether there can be any accommodation this year, it's not clear to me. If the staff can come up with something that all of a sudden, you know, the lights go on and this will work, I think we're open to considering it. Um, but if it requires uh, more time to get a viable plan, that disappoints everyone, but probably is the best uh, solution, um, then set your goal to next year. But I think by this time next year, the board would like to have uh, a plan that accommodates. Well, well before this. Year. Yeah, well, yes. I'm going in the next, uh, the, the snowmobile hunting well, season. The commitment to say very negative to hunters is pretty tough. For this solution. Yes. Right. All right. Um, <laughs> Can I ask how many permits have been issued for hunting? Uh, 145. Can you charge for those permits? Yeah, we got it. Charge that for it. Well, let me ask. How much insurance is insurance is paying for it? I'm just going to be exactly on one because land owners are so weird. If our insurance will not cover our, our people, if we pay them money, our language. So I'm kind of interested to see how that works. Well, we've been it's worked for 20 years. Yeah, I wouldn't. I think that's a yeah. separate question for our risk management agency of what we do and not to put their team no, this is. evening. I think what I'm hearing from the board and a consensus wise vote uh, is shaking up the conversation is that staff will, if it's the consensus of the board, if you're, you know, the consensus is for us to move to work towards a solution with both user groups with good intent. Uh, understanding that no matter what even the alignment that's going to be, if there's going to be a trail addition added to Queen Anne, we need to avoid the um, Eagle. Eagle's Nest, number one. Number two, we need to cross one or two places of water. We're hearing tonight at least one. That's going to require permitting uh, for that to occur, for us to put something on district land that is safe for a crossing. Uh, and then, um, then we still have, you know, how we accommodate snowmobiling and waterfowl because there still is a potential conflict unless we change the seasons up or split it down the middle or however to accommodate that. So we need to work through to what's reasonable. Um, again, we experience this on many of our sites when there's multiple user groups. And so we have to take a look at that. So I, I do appreciate um, if the board is, that's the consensus I'm hearing, if that's what you'd like us to do, then then I will work with staff to ensure that we work towards that as a goal. I, I think the board is comfortable with that. <laughs> yes, sir. I got a comment on the, the bridging. Um, so we can do temporary bridging and it doesn't require the permitting. There's um, been other areas in Lake County where we've put in floating bridges across streets and stuff like that that don't require a permit, but they're removed. Um, uh, at the beginning, they were put in at the beginning of the season or removed at the end of the season. But we have like uh, portable trailers and stuff like that that with just a flat deck out where we put across creeks, um, you know, that we buy with our grant money. And for us to get the grant money, we don't have to go through the permitting process as long as it's a temporary grid. I think all that technical information is really helpful you know, for us to understand the options. And I'm gonna uh, ask that the staff be working with the snowmobile group who have trails in other places and cross other creeks and use temporary structures or whatever else you work with so that information is shared and then it can be sort of um, uh, condensed or distilled or whatever the right verb is and some type of uh, uh, solution can be brought to the board. We're not gonna come up with that solution this evening, but I do think uh, with your patience and, and uh, um, there's a, a solution. Input from all. Yeah, input from all groups. Uh, the board is not opposed to this. I mean, it's not opposed to uh, everyone benefiting from the great outdoors. The board wants the staff to feel that it's done its job, which is uh, 
to meet the you know the requirements of the Conservation Act uh, and uh, and safety and not alienate anybody. And so it's it's complicated, but it's probably doable. And uh, we've taken we've made steps forward. Um, and now we're going to go on to the next item on the agenda. Yes. I have a gavel here someplace. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you all for your uh, understanding. Uh, so Elizabeth, you're, we're okay. Absolutely. Marching orders. Got it. Okay. 8.0 is other. I don't have anything else. So uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, public comments. Number two, now, gentlemen, you've had a chance to speak and ask questions and contribute. I don't know if there are any other public comments. Does that young man in the back want to get his first duck and also make his first comments at a public? All right. What about your homework tonight? All right. You're excused then. Um, all right. Do we need uh, a motion now for um, executive session? So, I, I, one second, Marty. Well, I'm asking if we need a motion now for executive session. Yes, a motion to the reasons why we're going okay. to do that. Okay, so uh, that's going to make it. Well, you have to read the motion. No, no one has to read it. Or who's Lloyd? Lloyd is going oh, yeah. to okay. consideration of a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 2C1 and personnel 2C5 lease purchase of real estate 2C11 11 probable litigation and 2C1 pardon yeah, 2C21 review of closed session minutes of the open meeting of that. Do you have a second? Sasha, have a second. And uh, Christy called the vote. Vice President Dom? Yes. Vice Chair Thomas? Yes. Trustee Gayton? Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? Yes. Trustee Everard? Yes. President Cook? Yes. Treasurer Fritz? Yes. After executive session, um, there's no action by the seeking. Okay. Trustee Gayton? Here. Vice Chair Thomas? Yes. Here. Trustee Zimmerman? Present. Treasurer Fritz? Here. Trustee Everard? Here. Vice President Down? Here. President Clinton? Yes. And now uh, 12.0 adjournment. We'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Okay, Chris. Oh, second. And Linda, second. Trustee Everard? Yes. Vice President Down? Yes. Trustee Clinton? Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? Yes. Treasurer Fritz? Yes. Trustee Gayton? Yes. President Cook? Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. We'll see you next.